Hello again, this is Paul Malubnock. We are continuing with part two of the book of Revelation in chapter nine. Let's uh, read beginning with verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. If you remember from earlier, uh, they uh, is that group of demons that are portrayed as locusts, uh, multitudes and multitudes of them. And so it says they have as king over them. So they have a king. They have someone leading them, which locusts do not have. Okay. It goes on. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And it, in Greek, he is called Apollyon. Real locusts do not have a king. But this army follows the rule of Satan, the angels of the bottomless pit. His name is Destroyer. The thief, Satan, cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. It's from John 10. Real locusts are pervasive destroyers, but this army only tortures those who do not belong to God. As God's people, we can be thankful that Jesus Christ holds the key of hell and death and exercises divine authority even over Satan. God has his timetable for all these events and nothing will happen too soon or too late. And you can refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 for that. Now Satan himself, uh, th this doesn't seem likely that it was him. Satan's abode is not uh, in the abyss, at least not until he is cast down into that bottomless pit or into the shaft of the abyss uh, at the end of the tribulation in verses uh, in verse 20, or chapter 20. In contrast, this king's authority seems to be limited to the demonic horde that comes from the abyss itself. So I believe that uh, what was let out of there was the leader, the high-ranking lieutenant of, of Satan, who will do his, his Lord's bidding with all of those demonic locusts. In any case, at the close of this frightening vision, John gives the ominous warning. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Through the release of the demon is unspeakably dreadful. Something even worse is coming. Now, if you remember, woe is the opposite of blessing. So if you're blessed, that's great. But when you have a woe, that's like a curse. Okay. Their king is leading the angel of the abyss. Uh, this is further confirmation that the locusts represent demons. The name Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek both mean destroyer. The object of these demons is to destroy people. God grants this lead creature permission here to carry out his objective against unbelievers as part of God's outpouring of wrath on earth dwellers. There's that word, earth dwellers, again. Probably we should identify this angel as one of the hierarchy of falling, fallen angels that emerges from the abyss with the other demons. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6, where it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The revelation of his name simply uh, expresses his objective. Identifying him as Satan is possible, but the text calls him an angel. The appearance of Satan later is going to be much more dramatic than the introduction of this angel. Let's continue to read with verse 12 and on. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great rivers Euphrates. Now that's something interesting. 
Now we have four angels at the river Euphrates. It's an important river. So at the sounding of this fifth trumpet, John witnessed the opening of the abyss and the release of tormenting demons that swarmed the earth like locusts, driving people mad. Then at the blast of the sixth trumpet, John saw four angels of death who had been held captive near the Euphrates River in what would become modern day Iraq. When they were all released, all the forces of hell broke loose across the face of the earth. Step by grueling step, the restraining grace of God was removed from the world, allowing Satan, his demons, and sinful, sinful humans to destroy the earth and each other. Note here that the scene of judgment centers on a particular part of the world, the Middle East. For someone reading the book of Revelation, say, 17th century colonial America might have been a little surprising. Such a reader might have even been tempted to interpret such a statement allegorically, but we who live in the 21st century shouldn't be surprised that much of the book of Revelation centers on Israel and its surrounding nations. In fact, for nearly the last 100 years, many Bible students have viewed the Middle East as a ticking time bomb ready to explode and move the whole world into the end times at any moment. I'm not trying to come across as sensationalist or uh, to shock you or anything because the times and season of the end are all in God's hand. We know that. He can bring them tomorrow or centuries from now. On the other hand, I want to take the Bible at face value let it say what it says. If it says the great river Euphrates, we should have in mind no river but the one that flows right through the heart of the Middle East. Both the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers originate in modern day Turkey. Euphrates snakes through Syria, flows straight into the center of Iraq, and then joins the Tigris before emptying into the Persian Gulf. Now, the four angels released at the Euphrates River are never identified as either angels of heaven or wicked demons. Most likely, these are four high-ranking fallen angels that figure prominently among the demonic horde of Satan's emissaries. They may very well be the invisible influences behind four ungodly nations and powers during the future tribulation period, demonic principalities and powers have stood behind world leaders throughout history. Daniel 10 gives us a, a glimpse of the kind of spiritual warfare that occurs in the invisible realm. Daniel learned that the angelic messenger had fought against the per prince of Persia in order to deliver his message to Daniel. And then he stated that the archangel Michael, one of the chief priests, had come to his aid. It's Daniel 10. He also mentioned the prince of Greece as another spiritual power. Similarly, Ezekiel 28 may refer to both the human ruler of Tyre and the invisible demonic king of Tyre, who gives the human leader his power and authority. Thus, in Revelation 9, the four angels bound at the Euphrates may be the spiritual powers of wickedness that stand behind for the nations that will oppose God and his people during the coming tribulation. These verses clarify that the fifth, sixth, and seven trumpet judgments are also the first, second, and third woes. John is the speaker here. He says, after these things indicate that the woes, not just the visions, are consecutive. Someone near the four uh, horns or symbolic of power of the golden altar is in heaven, giving a command after the sixth angel blew the sixth trumpet. Instead of seeing something, John now heard something. This angel instructed the angel who had blown the sixth trumpet to release the four angels who were bound at the Euphrates River. These are evidently four angels that John had not seen before. They must be fallen angels since God's angels are never bound. 
God had a purpose for them to fulfill and order their release to accomplish his will. Scripture does not record when or why God bound these angels, but evidently he restricted them as a punishment to them. Perhaps he imprisoned them when Satan rebelled against him. Now the Euphrates River, including the whole Mesopotamian region that it drains, had been the border between Israel and its enemies to the northeast, namely Assyria and Babylonia. It was also the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire in John's day. This is the end of mercy, and so one angel to the sixth angel, the one whose voice come out of the altar, says to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And this too is fascinating. Who are these four angels who are bound? Well, first of all, never in scripture does it say holy angels are bound. I've mentioned that before. Why would they need to be bound? The only reason you'd bind someone is to prevent them from doing something, which he would do to the demons or to those who went against his will in heaven. Holy angels can't do what God doesn't want them to do. There's a lot of negatives here. You don't have to bind holy angels to prevent them from doing what they would do against the will of God, because they wouldn't. So the fact that they are bound should make it clear to anyone that they're demons, fallen angels who needed to be restrained. And this is a perfect tense verb, which means that something has bound them in the past with the continuing results. They are in a state of condition of having been bound. So here are four bound demons, fallen angels. Uh, they're another segment of Satan force, Satan's force. Now, obviously, Satan doesn't want them bound. He'd like to have his demons running loose all over the universe all the time. The demons didn't want to get sent to the pit. You remember they pleaded with Jesus earlier. Satan doesn't want them bound. And here's another group of four that has been bound, reminding us that God controls all the demonic forces. Now, these four are apparently in charge of a massive demon horde, not those on the earth, not those who have been up in space battling angels who now, uh, according to Revelation 12, have been cast down to the earth, not those who have come pouring up the shaft of the pit described in the first part of this chapter. Here's a whole new group, a new horde of demons controlled by these four who are bound by God. Now, interesting enough, it says that they're bound at the great river Euphrates. This is a very interesting thing. If you read Jeremiah 6, and uh, it won't take too long, but you'll note that Jeremiah there is describing the day of the Lord. Several times he refers to the Euphrates. And when the day of the Lord hits, it's going to involve some action associated with the location of the Euphrates River. Now, the immediate question that comes is, uh, why are these demons bound at Euphrates? Why has God kept them captive there? Well, if you look back a little bit in history, you see some significance. It was one of the four rivers at the Garden of Eden. You remember that there were four rivers in the Garden of Eden. There was one, and of course, there was that pre-flood was different than the one after the flood. But the original Euphrates was in the place of Satan's deception of Adam and Eve. It was in the area where Satan first began his assault on man. The river Euphrates has a very interesting history. The river Euphrates begins in the Armenian mountain, some of the highest in the earth, flooded in the springtime with melting snows. It comes down to the Taurus mountains and down through the Mesopotamian valley to the Persian Gulf, all the way through that area of the world. It's the most important, the longest, the biggest of all rivers in Western Asia, but it was the place where sin was first known, the place where misery first began. It was the place where the first lie was told, where the first murder was committed, where the first grave was dug. Euphrates River was the scene of the great apostasies before and after the flood. 
the Euphrates River was the scene of the rise of Israel's greatest and most uh, oppressive enemies. The area around the Euphrates River was the scene of the long years in which the children of Israel dragged out their wearisome days of captivity. The Euphrates River was the scene of the rise of those great world empires that opposed God's people, Babylon, Medo-Persia. There in that place, four great powerful demons, magnets of evil, are chained by God. And they have in their hands the power to do awful destruction. But God restrained them. The Euphrates, according to Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, was also the eastern boundary of the Promised Land. It was also the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire, which is to be restored and revived at this time under the Antichrist. It is the place where the city of Babylon is. And you'll remember in Revelation 17 and 18, both the final form of world religion and the final form of world economy are called Babylon. These could well be the very demons who controlled Babylon of old, who controlled Medo-Persia of old, who controlled Greece of old, who controlled the Roman Empire in its day. Interesting enough in Daniel, just a note in Daniel's chapter 10, just a couple of verses to read. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, I mentioned before, was withstanding me for 21 days. That's a demon who was leading Persia from the satanic vantage point and Michael had to go in and get him out of the way. Down in verse 20, I, I am now going to return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. And that was all in verse 20. So you could see that there were demons associated with these great, great empires with Persia, Greece, Babylon, all of those. And these four have been held prisoner. One other thing, as Satan had entered Eden and corrupted Eden in that same location, later on that same part of the world, he started another corruptive influence, the result of which is still going on because it wasn't drowned like the first corrupt effort. It's the Tower of Babel. Remember that? the original Babylon in the same area of the world. And out of that complex Babylon in the same area of the world uh, that was spawned from the Tower of Babel, Babel came the complexity of pagan religiosity that involved astrology, pantheism, polytheism, idolatry, spiritualism, uh, naturalistic philosophies, all those uh, all that garbage has penetrated all over the world. It was originated the Tower of Babel. And when all that was scattered and the languages were scattered, they took the religion, the false religion of Babel, and populated the world with it. So you see the Euphrates is a demonic area. Let's look at verse 15 and 16. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard, he said, their number. The army from the east was at the golden altar of incense that the angel offered the prayers of the saints. Now from the same altar, from the heavenly perspective, if you remember, a voice speaks, commanding the four angels, be loosed. The angels are apparently wicked because no angel would be bound. Good angel. Uh, each angel in charge of part of the vast army that flows uh, at the liberation, an army of 200 million beings probably. The army is released at a precise time uh, for a special purpose, to kill. Not just torment this time, to kill. A third of the world's population since a fourth of mankind has already been killed. So if you do the math on that, it's really half of the original amount of population that are going to die. Half of all people, of all those on the earth of unbelievers. There may be some believers that die during that time too, but
but they go to heaven. Now the horsemen may be humans under the control of the four angels, or more likely the horsemen are demons. Uh, the description of the horses argue for an angelic army as it does leadership, namely four angels. So the angels we know are demons, therefore the rest of the army is most likely demons. There's a lot of them. Uh, years ago, Red China claimed to have an army of 200 million uh, people. And that was from Time Magazine in 1965. The combined Axis and Allied forces at their peak in World War II totaled about 70 million. An angelic army of 200 million demons is not hard to imagine, if you think about that. And uh, that, those numbers are from the World Almanac, 1971. The power to influence the world may be limited today, but during the tribulation, the divine restraints will be lifted. And in class, we talked about that, that even today, there's restraints. God has restrained uh, the evil, the sin in this world to some degree. It's still out there. But in those days, in the last days, in the day of the Lord, he will take off all of the cuffs and they'll go uh, to, uh, to influence the entire world. Let's not forget that the release will be according to God's timetable, however. They are unable to move their human puppet rulers to action until the exact moment that God allows. Although they serve their master, Satan, their their actions will be ultimately accountable to the sovereign permission of God. In fact, their release is literally scheduled in God's plan for a specific hour and day and month and year. That would be something to know, wouldn't it? But we don't. Never think that, that life is merely a series of haphazard events tossed into the air by blind fate for us mortals to catch or to dodge away from. On the contrary, we can rest in the confidence that our all-knowing, omnipotent God not only knows whatever comes our way, but directs it according to his good purposes. As we read in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we'll see soon these things that work together for the good of God's elect do not always mean the good of everyone. When the angels of death are released, their goal will be to kill a third of humanity. Verses 18 reveals that they will be successful in their endeavor. Don't run past this figure too quickly. A third of humanity today is over two billion people. No wonder God has actively restrained these wicked angels for many centuries. Peter in 3, 9, 2 Peter, should I say, in, uh, in chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God's gracious disposition towards the world staves off the relentless wrath of the forces of evil, but when this present window of opportunity for repentance is shut, a dark cloud of wrath will quickly close in. The next several verses fills in the details of how this hideous holocaust will be accomplished. Let's read starting with verse 17. And now this is how I saw the horses in my vision, John says, and those who rode them they wore breastplates of color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horse, horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, once again, with heads, and by means of them, they wound, they wound people. As we identify this as a literal army of men moving in conquest across the globe, probably um, not men, 
For one thing, the emphasis in this paragraph is not on the riders, but on the horses. The description can't fit war horses as we know them today, or for that matter, modern warfare equipment such as tanks. To assert that uh, is this is a literal army and to point to some nation as China that claims to have 200 million soldiers is to miss the message John is seeking to convey. The deadly power of these horses is in their mouths and tails, not in their legs. Fire, smoke, and brimstone issue from their mouths and their tails are like biting serpents. They can attack men from the front as well as from the rear. It can take, uh, or I, I assume that this is another demonic army heading, headed by four fallen angels and that all of them are today bound by the Lord, unable to act until God gives them permission. Why are they bound to Euphrates River? Not sure, though that area is the cradle of civilization, not to mention one of the boundaries to Israel. So the horses were swift implements of war in ancient, ancient times. Red, blue, and yellow breastplates covered both horses and riders. This was apparently their only armor, and it is a defensive armor. Lions, like horse heads, would be very different from those of ordinary horses, or just heads of horses that appear exceptionally bold and majestic. Natural horses do not breathe fire, smoke, or brimstone. These may be figures described in their prophecies of judgment. This verse suggests that this army is probably something other than a human army of cavalry. Probably it is. As I mentioned earlier, an angelic army. Fire, smoke, and brimstone are natural elements that God uses to bring judgments, especially in the past. The repetition of this definite article, the, in the Greek text, tau, indicates that these are three distinct plagues. Together, they will be responsible for the largest death toll in human history so far. Some interpreters have suggested that what they represent are modern weapons that shoot both forward and backward, such as missiles. Let's continue. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not represent did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor can they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. One would think that the combination of the five months of torment and then later death from fire and brimstone would bring men and women to their knees in repentance. But not as such is not the case. The, these judgments are not remedial, but they're about retribution. God is upholding his holy law and vindicating these people who would not believe. And he's vindicating his suffering people that they asked for in Revelation 6 under the altar, if you remember that. Even a casual reading of Revelation 9 reveals the awful wickedness of mankind, even in the midst of God's judgments. The most frightening thing about Revelation 9 is not the judgments that God sends, but the sins that men persist in committing, even while God is judging them. Consider the sins that men and women will be committing. Demon worship, which goes hand in hand with idolatry, will be the leading sin, as it seems like it always has been. Satan will be at work, always under the permission of will of God, remember? And Satan has always wanted to be worshipped. A great deal of religion will be practiced at this time, but it will be false religion. Let me say that again. A great deal of religion will be practiced at this time, but it will be false. People will worship the works of their own hands, which could well include the buildings they construct, the machines they make, the cities they build, as well as their idols. Here are dead sinners worshiping dead gods. 
Psalms 115 talks about that. Their gods will not be able to protect or deliver them. Yet these people will continue to reject the true God and worship Satan and idols. Murder and theft will also be uh, a right in those days. It will, uh, various kinds of sexual immorality, the words translated sorcery in the Greek word pharmakia, interesting, which means the use of drugs. So drugs will often be used in pagan ritual rites and demon worship. As we see the expansion of today's drug culture, it just seems to be the laws are more lenient and more lenient and giving anyone the opportunity to use at some point any drug they want. We have no problem envisioning a whole society given over to these demonic practices. Mankind will be breaking the first two Mosaic commandments by making and worshiping idols. In their murders, they will violate the sixth commandment and in their thefts, the eighth commandment. By their fornication, they will break the eighth commandment. By their fornication, they will break the seventh commandment. It will be an age of lawlessness with every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. But God is working out his plan and neither the sins of mankind nor the schemes of Satan will hinder him from accomplishing his will. We have now come to the midpoint of tribulation, a time during which some important events must take place. Thus far, we have covered about three and a half years of this seven year period, the Daniel seventh week. During this time, the Antichrist began his career as a peacemaker and a special friend to Israel, but now his true character will be revealed. He will become a peace breaker and a persecutor of the people of God. These three severe judgments, fire, smoke, brimstone, will not move the remaining unbelievers as a whole to repent. Elsewhere in scripture, the phrase, the work of their hands refers to idolatry. Idolatry is ultimately worship of demons and understanding that John reflected that here. Ironically, these earth dwellers refuse to stop worshiping demons who are responsible for their misery under the six trumpet judgments. In his day, people fashioned idol images out of the material that John mentioned. Today, objects that people venerate made up of the same materials can be bought in stores and materialists idolize them. These unresponsive people will also continue in their moral, moral sins, murders, sorceries, immorality, and stealing. Things will not look bright for God's people during this middle stage of prophetic journey, but they will still be overcomers through the power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you for watching and listening, and may God bless you until we see you again in chapter 10 of Revelation. Thank you.